This is a motion picture about one of the most important arts of modern man, an art which makes magazines and books and newspapers possible. It all begins with a picture, such as the scene of the familiar New York skyline upon which we are looking. The photographic print which we shall see was born of this scene and is but one of the many varieties of artwork that enters Horan's modern photo engraving plant. Here is a good example of silhouette act on copy. Another type of artwork. This is a dropout copy, so called because of its pure white areas that are to be completely eliminated from the printing plate. And this is a line drawing. Line copy is simply a pure black and white drawing which need not be photographed through the half tone screen. Engravings are not always reproduced in the same size as the artwork original. All art must be scaled accurately for reduction or enlargement with the aid of a slide rule according to specifications on the tissue layout. Now we begin our fascinating journey. The first step of photo engraving, as the name implies, is photography. The illustration is placed on a copy board which faces the lens of an enormous camera. Since this is a continuous tone copy, it must be photographed through a half tone screen, which is inserted in the back of the camera between the film and the Now let's take a closer look at the half-tone screen, the very heart of photo engraving. A half-tone screen consists of parallel etched lines on two glass plates. The plates are cemented so that the lines cross at right angles, thus producing transparent square apertures between the intersecting lines, and they are bound together by a metal frame. The screens vary from 50 to 200 lines per square inch. Coarser screens are used for newspaper printing, the fine screens for printing on enamel paper. A screen that is 50 lines to the inch, like the greatly magnified section we see here, is so coarse that the magnified lines are easily visible. When copy is photographed through this coarse screen, it will naturally reproduce in a manner that is equally coarse. This is the back of the camera. It has been built into a dark room. This very practical arrangement permits the film to be handled, inserted into the camera, and finally developed without leaving the darkroom. Before the picture can be taken, this camera, as with any other camera, must be focused. The film is placed on the film board in back of the camera. Then through tiny holes, a vacuum sucks the film tight and flat against the door. When the door is shut, we are ready to make the exposure. We have now returned to the outside of the dark room. These brilliant lights are arc lamps. When the camera shutter is open, the exposure is made. The copy is photographed through the lens and half tone screen. The negative's latent image is developed under safe light conditions, which cannot affect the image development. Since the exposure was made through a screen, it follows that the developed negative will also show a photographic impression of the lens of the screen. These lines form the characteristic dot values that will subsequently represent the printing portion of the plate. Then the film is placed in a stop bath to temporarily halt developing, and the half-tone dots are closely inspected with a practice dye to make certain that they are neither over or underdeveloped. When the craftsman is finally satisfied with the values of the negative image, it is placed in a fixing solution and inspected a last time. The developed negative and the original layout tissue are now turned over to the stripper or negative turner. Let's listen to the instruction he receives. Joe, here are all the line and half tone negatives and the layout tissue for the house job. The black type in the upper area of the sky must serve print. The type in the bottom of the picture is to be pure white. You'll find all the negatives have been made for the setup. And here is the artwork in case you need it for your reference. If you have any further questions, Joe, just give me a call.
The tissue layout is sandwiched between the illuminated glass tabletop and a sheet of plate glass so that the negatives may be accurately stripped together. Knife cuts through the thin emulsion to a celluloid base which supports the film, and then the film is deftly and confidently stripped from its very base. Each piece of negative must be thoroughly wetted so that the negative turner can manipulate and assemble them on the glass flat. A tray filled with plain water serves to saturate the negatives and they are ready for the next operation. Each piece of film is placed on glass and squeegeed flat. A limpless piece of white blotting paper serves to absorb water and simultaneously smooths out wrinkles and air bubbles until each negative is practically a part of its glass vehicle. Here we observe a large line negative of type being combined with our skyline scene. Notice that the line negative must completely cover the entire illustration. If this were not so, the ends of the line negative would cause a line of demarcation in the engraving. The line negatives are then squared up with a straight edge. Another chore of our stripper is to touch up spots or any transparent tears in the emulsion with an opaquing solution. Many negatives are combined on the large plate glass sheet for expedience, and so another step in our journey is completed. Now we are ready to work with the actual plate. But first, the copper plate must be scrupulously clean to remove any dirt, grease, or oxidation. Scru Washing and scrubbing with pumice helps to put some tooth in the smooth copper so that the sensitizing solution will adhere. In order to make the clean copper plate sensitive to light, it must be coated with a light sensitizing solution. The solution used here is bichromated gelatin. It must be evenly distributed over the entire plate. For this, it is placed into a whirling apparatus. The centrifugal force spreads the gelatin in a thin film over the entire plate and speeds drying. The coated plate, which in effect is not unlike a sheet of photographic print paper, is placed into another vacuum printing frame with the negative. A vacuum sucks the negative tight against the plate, making perfect contact. Light passing through the transparent areas of the negative will harden the bichromated gelatin on the copper plate. The exposure is carefully timed. Arc lights are turned on and the exposure is made. Notice that the entire frame oscillates. This is to prevent any imperfections in the glass from becoming printed onto the plate. The plate must be developed like any other piece of film. It is washed in running water, which actually develops the image. While the exposed parts of the plate are developed, the gelatin not affected exposure to light is washed away. The developed picture is coated with aniline dye to bring out the image. And here it is, an actual photographic image printed on gleaming copper. The quality of the dots of the image are painstakingly inspected. Sometimes zinc or magnesium plates are used instead of copper. The process differs only slightly. Zinc plates, like copper plates, must be scrubbed, but the sensitizing solution is called cold top and is of a slightly different chemical nature. The sensitizing solution is whirled to get even distribution and to dry. The image is printed by contact on the sensitized zinc exactly as on the copper plate. However, the zinc plate is not developed under running water, but rather developed for several minutes with a special cold top developer in a developing tank, 
Then it is washed and spun dry. But now, let's return to our copper plate as it passes through the other stages of photo engraving. After the image has been developed and fixed, it is made permanent by intense heating. Then the back of the plate is coated with acid-proof shellac so that it will not be affected by etching. Before the first bite of acid is applied to the plate, the etcher paints in areas of the plate to make them acid resistant. This prevents the acid from being spent unnecessarily and hastens the acid's corrosive action. The plate is scrubbed with a salt and iron solution to clean it of scummy deposits. After the plate is made brilliantly clean, the first bite of acid is applied. The etching bath for copper is called perchloride of iron. This first bite sets the top of the dots out in relief because only the areas of the plate that were not exposed to light will be etched by the iron solution. But this is only the beginning of the etching process. The plate is now brushed with an acid-resistant powder, picturesquely named dragon's blood. This powder is brushed on in four directions, one direction at a time with expensive camel's hair brushes. When this dragon's blood is heated, it melts and the resin forms a protective coating on the sides of the dots. The dragon's blood must be burned in after every powdering. The unprotected valleys of the dots are subsequently etched by the acid, creating the necessary printing depth that will keep the bottom of the plate from printing up on the paper. The plate is rapidly cooled and now it is ready for the acid bath. We have emptied one of the acid tanks just to get a better view of it. Notice the paddles which will splash or agitate the acid against the plate. Of course, in the actual etching process, this tank is partly filled with acid, and now our plate is being put in the etching bath for the second bite. The second bite clearly shows the effect of the acid. The valleys are deeper and the protective dots stand out in relief. Dragon's blood is applied for the second time. Again, the plate is heated, then cooled, then placed into the acid bath. Etching is always done in stages, which vary with the coarseness of the screen. All through the photo engraving process, the dots must be carefully inspected. And here we see a close-up of just what a dot should and should not look like. Number one is an over-etched dot where the top has been eaten away by acid, usually caused by a poor application of bicromate. Number two is an undercut dot caused by improper dragon's blood powdering. When an electrotype mold is made from such a dot, the undercutting prevents the release of the mold. Here we have a perfect dot. It has a flat top with tapered sides which have been etched clean and deep. A good dot structure means a good printing plate. After the proper printing depth has been achieved by the etching stages, the plate is washed, dried, and dusted with a white chalk powder. While many values have now been created by chemical and mechanical means, it remains for the etcher to perfect the printing quality of the plate. This he does by hand with great care and skill by staging and re-etching. Here the plate is having some solids painted in with a resist. And when this has been burned in, the plate is acid resistant. So that he may better see the progress of his work, the etcher again dusts it with chalk powder. Apparently, he feels that the various tone values do not conform to the copy. 
Slowly, carefully, he is re-etching by hand. At the stage, he uses acid on a brush. Then he arrests the action of the acid with a cotton swab. When the etching is completed, the plate is cleaned and sent on to the next department in the photo engraving plant. What a racket! This is surely the noisiest part of the shop. A rapidly revolving cutter suspended in the mobile spindle head is chewing up unessential metal from the printing plate. That is the job of the router. The important for the surface of the plate in areas that are not to be printed. The operator of this machine is called a router and is very skilled indeed. It is easy to see that one slip can completely ruin all the work that has gone on before. of the plate, a channel or flange, one-eighth of an inch wide, is cut on all sides of the plate. This is called beveling. The beveled flange will eventually be used as a tacking edge when the plate is mounted on hard cherry wood. The excess metal around the flange is then snapped off. This kind of bevel can only be used on a square or rectangular shaped plate. Now there remains only the few final touches of the finisher. The finisher is in essence an artist. The plate is canvas, acid and staging solutions his paints, swabs and tools his fine brushes. Here an engraver is deftly removing burrs from the plate's edge. The finisher outlines objects and vignettes. He tools and repairs broken lines and dots and mechanically alters the dot structure. Here he is applying the finishing touches to our picture of the New York skyline. The finisher uses many tools for his delicate trade, trimmers, burnishers, and many others. But most important of all, the Haram finisher uses his knowledge, patience, and skill tools born of many years of experience. The plate is now almost finished and it is time to re-examine the photo engraver's handiwork. This is done by pulling a proof or a trial impression of the printing surface. Now the ink is applied to the plate and the proof is being pulled on a hand proof press. Should this proof still show some imperfections or deviations from the original, it would be returned to the finisher. A close look at the dots on the proof tells the story. The plate is perfect. This stacking machine spitting nails is fastening the plate to a block of hardwood. Another method of mounting more recently devised is called flush mounting. In this case, the plate is bonded to the wood with adhesive. No nails are used. A strip of paper protecting the adhesive is peeled away. The plate is then placed onto the wood coated with adhesive. Actual bonding takes place through heat and pressure applied in this machine. After the plate and block have cooled, the bond between them is so tight that they cannot be separated short of splitting the wood. Excess wood can easily be trimmed off with a power saw. In case of flush mounts, the printing surface can come right to the edge of the block. And here is the finished plate, a product of the fine art of photo engraving by Horan. Yes, we have followed our original print from the camera 
right down to the final stamping of the union label. And we can follow it no further. For the job, finished in record time, is on its way to you for reproduction in magazines, books, pamphlets, or a hundred other ways. Then Day, named after its inventor, is a mechanical method of laying tints composed of lines, dots, and other textures. The tints or patterns are transferred from an inked gelatin stencil to the metal just before it is etched. Here, a skilled technician is gamboging a zinc plate. In other words, he is screening out areas where Bende is not to show. Bende screens come in a great number of different patterns. There are actually several hundred different screen designs ranging from 6 by 8 to 16 by 20 inches. Here our technician is picking out by the customer. The ink is rolled onto the Bende screen in all directions, covering the screen with a thin film of ink. Now the screen is hooked over the plate. This apparatus is called the shading machine. The remaining areas of the plate are masked off by a sheet of paper and will therefore be free of bende tints. Now comes the delicate art of transferring the tint from the screen to the plate. The instruments used are agate-tipped burnishers, small rollers, and occasionally the handle of a common toothbrush. A close inspection of the bende dot or pattern tells whether ink was supplied in the right amount. Here is how the plate looks just after the bende has been applied. When the tints have been laid, the stopping solution is washed off and only the unmasked areas of the plate show the bande pattern, used so much today to impart shaded effects to line drawings. Here is a color transparency. Using this picture as an example, we shall see the major steps of four color process engraving. Most colors can be produced from a combination of the three primary colors, red, yellow, blue. Separation for the red plate is made through a green filter. An exposure is made resulting in this continuous tone negative. Because filters cannot perfectly separate the values, color corrections are made in the continuous tone negative and on the positive. The corrections are made by retouching areas that appear too dense using chemical means. Areas that need colors are treated with additional dyes. The color corrected continuous tone positive is rephotographed through a half-tone screen. The picture seen here is the resulting screened negative. This the screened negative is then printed on metal, etched and finished. The finished plate, fruit and red ink, looks like this. For the yellow plate, the transparency is photographed through a blue filter. Each one of the color plates is produced in exactly the same manner, except for changes in the color filter. A proof of the yellow plate looks like this. The next color is blue, and for this separation, the copy is photographed with an orange filter. The necessary steps of photo engraving are performed, and we have a correct proof of the blue values of our picture. Lastly, a black plate must be made through a yellow filter. Although there is no black in nature's spectrum, photomechanical interpretation needs a neutral color for technical density and modeling reasons. A proof of the modeling plate when proofed together in perfect register, a beautiful four color proof. The finishing stages 
a four-color engraving realizes an almost indescribable combination of artistry and technical color understanding. For no matter how excellent the preceding steps have been performed, it remains for the color finisher to balance the plates so that the final printed proof will be a facsimile reproduction of the original artwork. With the color copy serving as his guide, the tools of his trade at hand, the craftsman makes possible the most widely used method of true to life reproduction, letterpress color printing. Here we see a four color Van de Cook press in operation. This high speed proofing press produces color proofs under printing conditions most closely approximating the operation of the press as used in modern printing plants. Here is a magnification of the dot pattern of color illustration. Progressive proofs are of considerable importance to the printer, who will eventually print the illustration for the customer. A proof of each color in its proper printing sequence and a combination of each color printed together in register serves as the pressman's guide for printing fidelity. If the rotation or printing sequence of the ink compressions were changed, conspicuous changes in the result would occur. In conclusion, it should be observed that when each screened negative is made, the half-tone screen is rotated or shifted slightly to a predetermined angle. In this way, a more blended, crisper color reproduction results because almost entirely all of the printing surface of the paper is covered by ink, thus creating a continuous tone illusion. The final proof in a series of progressives shows all four colors true to the original artwork and with all the brilliance and clarity. This is the fruit of Horan craftsmanship, a superb example of the art of color photo engraving. engraving in color or black and white as practiced by the Horan Engraving Company is one of the complex arts of modern man. This art is in evidence everywhere on packages, labels, pamphlets, books, newspapers, in a thousand places. For photo engraving is one of the vital tools of our economy.